Hi, everyone. Welcome to our advanced screening of Don't Feed the Coyotes as part of our Bay Nature Talk series. I'm Taylor Crisalgo, Development Manager at Bay Nature, and I'm so grateful you could join us today. We are thrilled for the opportunity to share this advanced screening, followed by a Q&A with filmmaker Nick Stone Shearer, alongside Bay Area self-taught naturalist Janet Kessler and wildlife ecologist with Presidio Trust, Jonathan Young. The film will not be available on our website after the screening, but will be available to the public later in the fall. If you have any questions while the film is running, please enter them in the Q&A box below and we'll get to as many of them as we can after the film. In case you've never checked us out, Bay Nature is a nonprofit that tells the stories of local nature through quarterly print magazines and online articles. You can view us online or subscribe to our print magazine at baynature.org. We'd like to thank the David Brower Center in Berkeley for providing our technical support this evening. We'd also like to thank everyone who registered for the event and a special thank you to those of you who made the suggested $20 donation for tonight. Your support helps Bay Nature bring you these events. With that, we hope you enjoy the film. Wow, just what a wonderful film. It's just, it's so exciting to be a part of and to be able to just take part in the screening. So thank you so much to Nick and the team. Um, just a friendly reminder to everyone to please drop any questions that you had during the film or any questions that come up in the Q&A box below and Nick will get to as many of them as he can. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Bay Area-based filmmaker, Nick Stone Shearer. So please take it away, Nick. Thank you, Taylor, and uh, thank you everybody from Bay Nature who made this happen. Uh, you guys do fantastic work and um, have a fantastic community, so I'm really thrilled to be a uh, part of that today. Um, also, thank you to everyone who came out and watched uh, and just spent a half an hour uh, watching a story about coyotes. I think that's uh, really exciting to me and um, just thrilled to, to get to share it. This is the first time um, this film has been shared really in, in front of any group. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. Um, and thank you to the Brower Center uh, for, for hosting us. They're another great uh, community and great space in Berkeley. Um, and then lastly, thank you to, to John, uh, Jonathan Young and, and Janet Kessler, who um, maybe don't need much of an introduction uh, if you were paying attention for the last half hour. Um, we've got them here now, and uh, I see we've got a lot of questions uh, to get to. So without further ado, Janet and John, if you wanna hop on, um, I think let's just start talking coyotes and, and get, get to some questions. Uh, Janet, I think there were some questions about Scout and about Scout's first, uh, let's see, uh, the, her, her first male friend. So maybe you could just give us like a little update on, um, you know, because the, the, to, to fill folks in, the, the film, you know, we didn't finish filming yesterday. So there's been some time um, since the film actually stopped being made and, and, and today. So Janet, if you want to just, hop in and tell us like what's going on with Scout and, and her story. Okay. Um, Scout is six and a half years old now and on her way to the 11 to 12 year life expectancy I'm seeing here in San Francisco. By the way, her dad reached the ripe old age of 11 and a half while her mom at eight and a half had yet another litter this year. Through all the changes Scout went through, there were some constants which are continuing, like her steadfast determination and intense involvement in whatever she does. She is the alpha above her mate and calls the shots. I've seen her discipline him angrily, but never the other way around. Her emotions and intentions are always on display and easily read. Her focus now is on her pups and on finally being the highly social creature she is. She's a family lady. Last year, she had four pups. Of those, two males remain who help feed, discipline, babysit, and play with this year's litter. The new pups are honing their mental and physical skills through exuberant play. Favorite games include chase, keep away and beat up your sibling. And now at five months, they're venturing further and further afield. 
Scout is very affectionate, caring, and protective of her family, but also a harsh disciplinarian, uh, knocking them down when they get out of line. There's never room for any misinterpretation when she communicates with them. She is the boss. So Scout finally has her house in order. Sadly, she continues to scavenge, beg, and wait in the street for food and is rewarded for this. I'm working with the city to stop the feeding. Most people are thrilled to have her around, but then, of course, there are those who do not want her around. Great. So yeah, the, the challenge continues for her living on that little hill. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's a really, it's, a, it's I don't know if the film made it so clear, but it, it's a tiny little patch of earth um, surrounded by a lot of- Road, but surrounded yeah, by road. Mostly road, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Jonathan, what, what's going on at the Presidio? Um, is 15F still reigning supreme there? What, what's going on? Yeah, um, her, her and her mate, uh, this would be their second litter since their coup d'etat from uh, the last Al Prepare. And they've been, uh, it's hard to say this without, you know, trying to keep a, a neutral perspective, but they've been a really good urban coyote pair. And when I say that, I mean, They've pretty much kept to themselves for the most part, which is what, what we want from our urban coyotes. We want them to, to just kind of mind their own business, stay out of, you know, the paths of dogs and things like that. Occasionally things will happen, but very, very minor that can be avoided and for the most part are avoided. So they're doing well and the pups are doing well and their pups are going to start dispersing here soon, no doubt. So we're going to be seeing more young animals running around the streets. Um, which unfortunately also means we're going to probably start seeing a spike of roadkill young coyotes, which happens like clockwork this time of year, every year. Yeah. And so you talk about their, you know, they're, they're an ideal uh, urban coyote. Um, what makes an unideal urban coyote? Is it the, and, and is it, you know, what defines it, but also what, what kind of causes it? Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's, you got to think about dogs. If, if any, for any of the dog owners, we all know dogs are unique individuals. Coyotes are the same unique individuals. And just like people and dogs, that can change through time, depending on the exposure of their environment, the, um, the stimuli that they come across. And one of those things would be humans. And the biggest thing that Ben pointed out in the film was titled was people feeding coyotes that can start to really drive abnormal behaviors, which one of those abnormal behaviors would be coyotes approaching people. Um, and that's something that we absolutely want to monitor for and, and be aware of. If that's starting to happen, people are starting to feed these animals. We want to know, we want to nip that in the bud before serious behavioral modifications start to happen with these coyotes. But yeah, generally shy coyotes that kind of just, you know, they, they generally will just ignore people for the most part mostly even ignore dogs for the most part. That's, that's kind of an ideal coyote. There's plenty of natural food throughout San Francisco, rats and gophers and raccoons. They do not need our help with, feed, with food. They do not need it, they have plenty of food. And that's what makes a good urban coyote stay a good urban coyote is keeping them natural and wild. Well, uh, I'm gonna dive into some, some other questions we've got. So let's see. Um, uh, Michelle asks, is it typical for the female coyote to be the alpha or does that vary with individuals? Janet, you want to take that one? Yeah, so it varies with individuals. I have seen the female be the uh, alpha and I have seen the male be, be the alpha. So I think it's just a matter of personality, uh, but one, they're both the alphas actually, but one tends to be over the other and more dominant. Um, and uh, in Scout's case, she is the dominant one. All right, we've got a couple of questions that kind of line up here from Patricia and Dan. Um, Patricia asks, how many pups are produced each year and how many survive? And then Dan asks kind of a good follow-up, which is, is this uh, coyote population in the city growing, shrinking or stable? Um, John, you've got, I mean, you both are great, could answer this, but John, you want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I can, I can really mostly speak to Presidio litters and generalities. I think Janet can speak more 
on average litter sizes over time in San Francisco. But generally, I would say around between three to upwards of 10. It really kind of depends on the year and the, and the weather and the food availability. And there's a whole complex thing going on there with reproduction. In terms of survival, I think I mentioned in the film of, of all that we've monitored, which was a significant amount over three years, um, only two so far have actually, two that we've actually tracked, not that have been born, because we haven't tracked every single one that's been born, but two, we've, two have confirmed, excuse me, three, three confirmed to have survived um, up until this point at least. Um, and I, I feel that the, maybe the older they get, especially once they get past the second, second year, they start to have a higher chance of longer term survival, they get a little more street smarts. And then in terms of San Francisco population, that's that's constantly in flux. So it seems like it's probably stabilized right about now because there's mm -hmm. only so many places for coyotes in San Francisco. But every year more coyotes are born, but also every year coyotes, young ones especially, die. And new coyotes come in and kick out old coyotes and there's, it's constantly in flux, but it seems like it's pretty much stabilized. I'm sure Janet could speak more to that as well. Yeah, please so. Um, so uh, I have been seeing larger litters, and I attribute it to all the feeding that's going on. Uh, more robust litters of four, five, six, and seven in the last year, uh, whereas I used to see litters of two, three, and four, and only rarely a larger litter than that. Also, I'm seeing that uh, yearlings tend to remain longer on the land making the population seem uh, bigger. But generally, all the territories in San Francisco are owned, owned mostly by the alphas, and all the youngsters end up leaving. So every territory, and it's about two square miles per, per territory, has one family, uh, which is the mom and the dad, and then maybe some yearlings and the pups born this year. All of those leave eventually. So the population, I think, is uh, pretty stable. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions. I'm not going to pull one specifically, but there's a lot of questions about, um, you know, how do we address the sort of fear that people have? I mean, that, I think the questions about are the populations growing I speak to the fact that some folks are, are worried that maybe the city is being overrun with coyotes and this wasn't a problem five years ago or 10 years ago. And now if you go on Instagram or YouTube, there's it's full of videos and photos of coyotes everywhere. Um, so how do we how do we kind of address the the reality versus the the concerns that, that people have, which are valid, especially when there's you know people have little kids and they're in parks. Um, John, in your work, because you do so much, you know, official kind of um, as people call it, you know, human management as well as wildlife management. What's yeah. what works? I think I think uh, David said it perfectly in the film. It's education is, is <laughs> really the biggest part of that, and behavior, our understanding how our behavior can drive conflict. And when I say conflict, I don't just mean real conflicts which is a, a factor, but I also mean perceived conflict, which yeah. I'd say the vast majority that we're dealing with is perceived conflict, just because people, you know, they grew up in urban areas, they don't know coyotes, maybe don't even know what a coyote, like, or a raccoon is. So they see a coyote, they think wolf, they think rabies, they think all these things they've heard in the back of their head, in the movies and social media and pop culture. So it kind of, it kind of just, there's knee-jerk reactions of fear. And I think that people, when the more they learn and understand through films such as this, uh, the more they can at least appreciate and understand. They don't need to love them, but at least they can appreciate and understand like, okay, if I do this one thing, it's gonna result in something I don't want, but if I do this other thing, it's gonna result in, in a good situation where everything can be avoided. So that's, that's the biggest thing, it's a tall order. There's a lot of people, a lot of people to get the message out to. So again, having audiences like this and, and content like this to put it out there, um, it's it's almost a full time job. Absolutely, education I think is the answer. People need to know. Hey, there's really only one family in this whole area. You're seeing the same coyotes over and over again. We're not being overrun. Yeah. Right, we're getting down to uh, kind of the close here, but I want to get to I want to get to two more topics. Um, so let's try and get this, through this one, which is. Uh, there's some questions about how john how you do your work and how you track 
uh, coyotes and, and collar them. And there's Janet, Janet questions for you about how do you um, get this, gr this great photography and, and documentation of these coyotes um, without, you know, um, like being too much in their space without impacting them negatively. Um, John, do you want to start? And then Janet will pass yeah. it to you. Yeah, how do you do what you do? How do you get the data that, that's important? Yeah, so that's, um, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do in an urban area. Um, and of course, we are wanting to study these animals so that we can promote coexistence. We're not trying to remove these animals. That's not part of what we do here in this national park site that is the city of San Francisco. Those animals are protected in this federal landscape. And so we use very humane techniques that are tried and true and very basically uh, uh, neck loops is what we use. And they, they don't choke them because that's obviously not the point. We do not want to injure these animals because we don't want to track an injury animal. We want to be as humane as possible. So we use a lot of techniques and methods that are, are again tried and true by a lot of carnivore researchers, such as Ben Sachs. You met him in the film. Um, yeah, folks like him and others around the country who have done urban canine research like this have helped us develop these techniques and this methodology. So, so we that had a lot of experience doing that. It's very challenging in, in an urban area where there's a lot of off-leash dogs. There's a lot of homeless encampments. There's very few places where you can actually do that kind of work. Um, and it's, 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 it's very challenging, but so far we've had some success. And of course, again, the, 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 te the, the technology that we use is, is, is a, a very high tech, so very lightweight collars that are temporary and they will detach wirelessly when we type in codes through satellites to come down and they will knock them off. But fortunately, most of those coyotes don't survive long enough for the batteries on the collars actually come to an end. They get hit by cars. Janet, you want to tell us how, how you're able to... You know, so, yeah, you know, I photograph by usually blending in with everybody else who's in the park, and that's very easy to do. We're not like out in the wilderness where no other people are around. So I am like a park visitor, and I can easily get my photographs. I have a, a, a powerful zoom lens, and I can sit down and get my... Um, and watch them and uh, get their behaviors and figure out who they are. So that's my basic, the basic thing that I do. But I'm also looking at population and territories now in the city. Um, I've followed and mapped some dozen uh, dispersals in the city and I've defined San Francisco's almost 20 territories all through visual recognition of individual coyotes. And now for corroboration, I've turned to DNA and Professor Benjamin Sachs and his lab at UC Davis, where I'm now uh, collaborating uh, with a couple of his students. Um, and I expect the DNA extracted from the uh, SCAT, which I collect, to confirm my visual findings. So this is nice to have this as a kind of background. Uh, that study is also uh, even moving further than, than what I have done. Um, uh, PhD candidate Monica Serrano is uh, assembling a citywide pedigree, um, which is similar to um, 23andMe uh, for humans. Um, and she will be able to show how the, all the coyotes are related. And this then will allow us to identify dispersals and confirm those I've already seen, such as scouts from Glen Canyon and F-15's mates, that's a male, um, from North Beach to the Presidio in 2019. And of course, I'm expecting the almost 20 territories I've identified uh, visually to be borne out and um, uh, also fine-tuned by our SCAT finds. So the DNA we use all comes from scat and carcasses. We don't use radio collars or tags, so it's totally non-invasive. Um, and for a vast number of those coyotes, I've actually watched them defecate. So I know which DNA goes with which coyote, which helps us uh, put all this together. Yeah, I mean, we're really getting between the work that you both do, um, and not that you're alone, but you're certainly um, doing some really prominent work in this in this like specific subject, we're getting a, a clear picture. Um, and so I think to all the questions about asking for advice and how to 
um, assuage fears. I mean, I, I hope that in a few years, um, as more of your work gets seen and shared, um, folks can can understand that it doesn't need to, to be uh, always about about fear and conflict. Yeah. With that, yeah. though, I want to ask one last question because I think we got just a couple of minutes left, um, and that is around. Um, you know, in July, there was a coyote, and this was mentioned in the film, um, that was uh, euthanized by federal officials that were wildlife officials that were called in. Uh, and this coyote was, was like definitely exhibiting some concerning behavior. It was, there was bare, multiple incidents where young children were sort of approached or threatened in, in one way or another. Um, John, what, I mean, so I'd love to hear both your, just your quick takes on, on what happened. Yeah, absolutely. That was a, you know, we, of course, when we monitor with that interagency group that includes city government officials and federal officials, the Presidio Trust and National Park Service, we monitor all the activities that are reported um, for conflict, again, real or perceived, we monitor those, look for red flags. Um, and we have very specific protocols of approaching those so we can really understand what exactly was happening during these conflicts? If there's any video evidence, of course, we want to see that as well. But we got to get through the emotion to understand what was actually happening between the coyote and the humans and or the dog. And looking for signs of normal versus abnormal behavior. And so we knew over the years that that individual was being fed very heavily by people in the city very heavily. Bennett speaks to that. There was some serious feeding going on with that animal. And as we've been talking about, that is one of the number one things that can drive abnormal behavior. And being the authorities of the, the resources of the city and coyotes and wildlife are part of the natural resources. Um, it's a fine balance between public safety and conservation. And public safety is number one. I want everybody to understand that. Public safety, we take very seriously. And if we see red flags of abnormal behavior, we need to assess each one of those. And there's thresholds that can get crossed and there's certain things and tools you can use like hazing and things like that to try to scare the animal and modify its behavior. But at a certain point, there's very few things that you can do and balancing out public safety with all of the evidence for that individual, um, there wasn't much left in terms of options. And lethal removal is a tool that can and is be used but we take it very seriously. We want to know 100% certainty if and when we need to use that. Who is the culprit? So we can go in there surgically and get out the culprit and not the first brown coyote that happens to run by because that happens in some cities and they end up killing 10 coyotes before they get the one culprit. We don't want to do that. So we take that very seriously. Anna, you want to take it for a minute? Yeah, um, I think it's important to acknowledge all the factors driving this coyote's behavior. Feeding certainly is absolutely detrimental. As with Scout, it caused this coyote to hang around, approach people, and beg on the street. But he actually became docile and mellow because of it, not aggressive. It's something I've seen repeatedly with fed coyotes. They lose concern and wariness until... They are under pressure, such as during the pupping season. So a major factor here was actually denning messaging behavior, where during the denning season, coyotes approach dogs as threats, and unfortunately, small children are seen in the same light. Whether fed or not, this denning messaging behavior is part and parcel of normal coyote behavior and was involved with this Golden Gate coyote. Approaching children happened only around the denning area. I've seen the same behavior with Scout and with other coyotes. So education, I think, is very important. Uh, better signage. Jonathan has wonderful signs in the Presidio. We need better signage to let people know, hey, this is a denning area. And although there were signs up in the area, they were, they were not very strong. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's no one wants it to happen, but obviously, like John said, it's a tool and, and this is what happens when, when conflict emerges. It's never going to be perfect. There's always going to be bumps along the way. 
Um, and so, yeah, it takes folks like you guys uh, educating and, and helping smooth things out along the way. Um, with that, I think we're kind of going over time, um, just at time. Uh, thank you again, everybody for watching. I'm gonna pass this over to Taylor. Thanks again, Jonathan and Janet. Just thank you so much all again. Um, and yeah, unfortunately we did run out of time for tonight, um, but I just really wanna reiterate, thank you to Nick, Janet and John so much for this phone screening and the Q and A after. It's just really exciting to be a part of this special screening. So thank you so much. Um, as a friendly to everyone and friendly reminder to everyone in the audience, uh, the film will not be available on Bay Nature's site after the screening since this was a special advanced screening of the film. Um, however, the film will be available to the public later in the fall. So for more information on how you can access that, please visit don'tfeedthecoyotes.com. We'll also be sending an email follow-up um, with links to resources as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, but if you enjoyed our free virtual event, please also consider contributing at baynature.org. Um, but I just want to wish everyone a good evening to say my thanks. And thank you so much, Nick, to Janet, to John, uh, to Madeline and the Brower Center for all making this possible. So good evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone.